We're on part seven now. This is rest and sleep. It is the last of the physiological needs that we'll be discussing. After that, we go on to safety and security and up the pyramid a little bit further. And our objective for this lesson is that by the time you're finished, you should be able to apply the nursing process to the care of a client with an unmet need for rest and sleep. And although if you work in a hospital or um, even rehab or residential facilities, most people don't uh, use rest and sleep as their primary reason for seeking care, um, there are many, many clients who have unmet needs in this area, um, and it is the nurse's responsibility to plan and implement um, for those clients. So I'm going to give you your textbook resources. We're in mostly, sorry, Wilkinson and Treese, um, chapter 34, and it's pages 878 to 896. I'm going to guide you as we go along um, to let you know what is and is not um, absolutely necessary to master this concept. There's a lot of scientific information about REM sleep and non-REM sleep, and I don't want you to get too um, confused about those. We will talk about them, but um, our emphasis, as always, is going to be on assessing planning, implementing, and evaluating our care. Um, and so we'll sort of focus on those things. Okay, so let's start by um, talking about what rest and sleep are and why they're important. So rest is a condition in which the body is inactive or engaged in mild activity. And that activity should cause the person to feel refreshed. Now rest is important, but it's not, you know, in itself sufficient um, because you can be disturbed by all kinds of external stimuli when you're at rest. Um, you don't dream when you're at rest, your consciousness isn't altered. Whereas in sleep, you have that cyclically occurring state of decreased motor activity and perception, so you are less responsive to stimuli outside your environment, um, and your level of consciousness is altered um, in such a way that that rest can be really thorough and complete. So there are a lot of health effects of inadequate sleep. We're going to just talk about a few. Um, when you're not getting enough sleep, your immune system is weaker. You can gain weight. Particularly, you will gain weight in that um, sort of high-risk pattern of abdominal obesity um, because of the altered hormones. Um, your endocrine function is really influenced by sleep deprivation, um, and consequently, you get an increased risk of a lot of the major diseases, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, um, infections, and possibly cancer. Um, you have a decreased ability to learn and adapt and cope with your circumstances. Um, and you'll have a decreased ability to deal with um, physical pain as well. It's not on the list, but keep it in mind. People who aren't sleeping feel pain more acutely. So in your textbook, there's a lot of information on the physiolog physiology of sleep, and we're going to kind of skip past that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the different um, states of sleep. Let me kind of get rid of some of this stuff. So first we can start talking about non-REM versus REM sleep. Um, and I don't want you to get too bogged down in memorization. Remember, I'm not really asking you to memorize lists of things. I'm asking you to learn to apply concepts. Um, and so, oh, I'm sorry. Um, my concept here that I want you to take home from this is that um, all of the phases of sleep are really necessary for our health and well-being. And when you have a lot of interrupted sleep, um, or when you don't get a full night's sleep, you have sleep deprivation, you don't go through all of the cycles in adequate length and it impacts um, various functions. So let's talk about non-REM sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep. Um, non-rapid eye movement sleep is actually divided into three stages. Each one is a little bit deeper than the next. There's N1, which is the state of like, you know, halfway between sleeping and waking. Um, there's N2, which um, is a light sleep and you're easily roused. Um, everything decreases a little bit slightly. This is where we spend a lot of our sleep, most of it. About 50% of total sleep time is spent in um, that second stage. Don't memorize it, just understand that each one of these phases serves a purpose and that when you interrupt sleep, um, a lot of times you'll shorten some of these phases that are really important. Your deepest phase, or N3, is especially important for all of your restorative processes, such as healing or growth or tissue renewal. Um, and so when we keep interrupting this person, um, we are really impacting on their physiological functioning. With N3, when you wake somebody up, 
um, out of that very deep sleep, they're often very confused and disoriented. Um, you know, it's, it can be a very frightening experience for them. Um, and that makes up like 20 or 25 percent of your sleep time, but it is an important um, aspect of sleep. So now let's talk about REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. This is a very highly active sleep. This is the person who's maybe talking in their sleep, thrashing, um, tossing, turning. It's less restful. We all go through REM sleep. Some of us are a little more active than others. Um, but it's named rapid eye movement sleep because your eyes twitch. Um, this, is, this type of sleep um, represents about 25% of the time that we spend sleeping and it is really essential for mental and emotional restoration and part of the reason for that is that this is the stage where most of our dreaming occurs um, our very vivid dreams and our dreams are really the body's way of trying to process our mental and emotional experiences from our waking life and put them into some context that our subconscious can understand so if you interrupt REM sleep a lot a um, person might be more susceptible to anxiety um, or depression um, during REM sleep, your vital signs might increase. The pulse might be rapid and irregular. And if you wake somebody up who's in the middle of REM sleep, they'll usually respond fairly normally. They're not the ones who are um, really disoriented, like with the non-REM three. Um, but the one thing that I kind of want you to take away from this is not to memorize or take a lot of notes on REM versus non-REM. What I really want you to understand is that it is very disruptive to interrupt a person. Um, we go through these cycles about six times in an eight-hour sleep. Um, and we need all of them. And if you interrupt a person frequently, um, you disrupt the sequences of non-REM and REM sleep, and you Im uh, impair their physiological and mental and emotional functioning. Um, and so in the hospital, we want to try and minimize that. We want to encourage sleep to begin with, and then we're going to want to encourage as much uninterrupted sleep as is possible while still taking care of that patient's other needs. There are a lot of factors that affect rest and sleep. Um, age is one of them, and if you're interested in reading about that, you can go to page 885. Mostly in this course and in 137, we focus on the older adult because you'll get that content um, on the newborn and the child um, in other um, areas of the curriculum. So mostly we focus on the older adult, and what I would like you to remember about that is that the older adult spends fewer hours overall in sleep but has an increased need for rest um, and may suffer a lot from interrupted sleep um, because of things like having to go to the bathroom at night or being on medications that have side effects um, or just plain illnesses. Um, congestive heart failure is an illness that impacts rest and sleep. Anything that involves pain um, interferes with rest and sleep so older adults who have chronic pain syndromes may have trouble sleeping at night um, lifestyle factors are things that the nurse targets for intervention um, when there are sleep disturbances, and there's a lot of them. Physical activity is one of the bigger ones. People who are physically active tend to have better quality of sleep, and um, that's true as long as your physical activity is at least two hours before um, bedtime. If you exercise too close to bedtime, you usually have trouble falling asleep. Um, diet does impact rest and sleep. To a lesser extent, um, foods that are heavy in saturated fat or foods that ha are very spicy can interfere with um, good sleep. Um, carbohydrates seem to promote sleep, so your starchy foods and your sweet foods um, before bed sometimes will help uh, promote healthy sleep. Um, caffeine and nicotine have really horrible impact um, on sleeping. So um, people who are having insomnia or, or other sleep disturbances might have to be counseled about their caffeine usage. Um, having a cup of coffee in the morning is one thing. If you're drinking coffee all day, obviously um, you're going to have a harder time falling asleep and staying asleep. Nicotine also um, tends to make people have more difficulty falling asleep. So um, those are some things that impact it. Alcohol, a lot of people will use alcohol to try and get to sleep. Uh, but the quality of sleep after consumption of alcohol is generally poor. Um, you spend less time in REM sleep, and uh, in addition to that, there's a lot more frequent awakening um, and difficulty staying asleep. So people who use alcohol as a means to get to sleep might need some education. Um, medications can have side effects um, that interfere with sleep. Either they make you groggy, your allergy medicine might make you sleepy, like Benadryl, or they might give you insomnia. Um, 
you know, people take a lot of different medications that might reduce the overall amount of sleep or reduce the time you spend in REM or non-REM. Um, and so we need to assess the person's medication use if we're trying to troubleshoot their sleep problems. Um, illness obviously impacts um, sleep and rest. They increase the need for it, but they might decrease um, the quality of rest and sleep. So, you know, if you have a fever or if you're in pain, um, if you're uncomfortable for other reasons, and also people who have chronic conditions that affect the respiratory system, because when they lay down, they're, um, they get even less oxygen. They either get obstructive sleep apnea or maybe in congestive heart failure, a lot of times they get what's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and that's a special kind of shortness of breath that happens at night when the person lays down. Um, and then you have like mental health issues, depressed people, people with clinical depression either sleep too much or they don't sleep enough. Um, those are both symptoms of depression. Anxiety um, tends to lead to insomnia because the person's fight or flight hormones are usually going, the cortisol, and that's keeping them awake. Um, and then after we talk about illness and lifestyle, there are a lot of environmental factors that impact rest and sleep. And this is important um, both for the client who is at home, um, who needs modification of, those, of the environment, and for the client who is hospitalized or admitted to a long-term care facility where the environment might not be completely under their control, but we might have some um, input to that. Um, things like temperature, um, people sleep better in a cool room than they do in a hot room. Um, noise levels obviously impact it and I'm going to tell you right now that a noisy nurse's station is the enemy of good sleep when you're in the hospital. Um, anything that's unfamiliar to the person tends to disrupt sleep. That novelty sort of keeps them awake. Uh, so people sleeping in a hotel room or a dorm room for the first night generally will complain that they can't sleep in the new place. Um, so those are some of those things. Bright lights are another one. So um, environmental factors may need to be modified for that person. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the sleep disorders. We have um, two broad categories. The dysomnias, which are either disorders um, that are characterized by the inability to fall asleep or stay asleep, um, or parasomnias. And those are disorders that um, involve waking behaviors that occur during sleep states, like sleepwalking. And those can become a problem if there's a safety issue involved. Um, children that wander while they're sleepwalking, um, that kind of thing. So sleep deprivation is not actually a sleep disorder. It's um, a cluster of symptoms that result from prolonged um, lack of sleep, um, usually related to a dysomnia or related to um, lifestyle choices. Um, so we'll get started on the dysomnias. So the broadest category of sleep disorder is going to be insomnia. Um, insomnia is a medical diagnosis. Um, there are nursing diagnoses that we will start talking about, like sleep deprivation. But in insomnia, the person complains of um, one of three things. Either they're unable to fall asleep easily on their own. It takes them hours to fall asleep. Or they are unable to stay asleep. Maybe this person, common in the elderly, um, they can fall asleep early, um, but then they're awake at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then they possibly have an inability to go back to sleep after um, awakening or being awakened. Um, and these are people who might have a really tough time with hospital routines. Um, true insomnia, according to the American Psychological Association, as cited in your textbook, occurs three nights a week for three months or longer, um, despite the fact that there's opportunity for sleep. This isn't the same as somebody who um, is being deprived of sleep um, because they're airplane pilots and they can't or something like that. This would be somebody who wants to sleep, has the opportunity, and just can't. Um, sleep difficulty is a little bit different. There's a variation on insomnia. And these are people who might be getting adequate amounts of sleep, um, according to what we observe, but they awake and they don't feel that they got any rest at all. Um, and they might feel that the quality or quantity of their sleep is inadequate. And that can be, you know, per, you know a long-term kind of thing or it can be a transient thing. Now we already mentioned that insomnia is the most common um, of the sleep disorders, so let's give you some kind of idea of how many people are affected by it. About two-thirds of everybody that you meet is going to have trouble sleeping at least once a week. Um, and about 10 to 20 percent of the general population, which is a lot of people, meet the DSM-5 criteria for true insomnia, that three times a week um, for at least three months. The most common populations affected are women, 
um, older adults over the age of 60, chronic illness, um, including diabetes, hypertension, cancer, thyroid disorders, and then your shift workers, including your nurses who work, you know, 11 to 7 or 7P to 7A, um, very frequently have trouble with the flip-flopping of day and night. Um, and so those are some folks you'd want to watch out for. Now, this is daytime consequences of insomnia. Keep in mind, if you're dealing with a shift worker, these consequences could occur at night. Mostly it's just something that happens during your waking time, and we all kind of know what it feels like to not get enough sleep. I think that's a fairly common experience. Um, so, you know, you've got a person who's very tired, who can't concentrate. Maybe their reflex time and their coordination is impaired, so driving is impaired. Um, they're fatigued. Apathy sometimes or irritability, we all know what it's like. You get very grumpy. Um, and so those are some daytime consequences of insomnia, or at least waking time consequences of insomnia. These are people who are more likely to um, get in car accidents, by the way, because their concentration is poor. Um, and so driving while uh, sleep-deprived can be a little bit like driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs because you're impaired. Um, so anyway, there are some medical treatments for insomnia, but really um, they should be considered almost short-term treatments. A lot of things that nurses can do, and we get to interventions, we'll kind of talk about them, um, but they can be medically managed, uh, the insomnias, with certain medications. Um, there are sedative hypnotics, like your barbiturates. When you get to farm, you'll learn more about them, and we'll kind of cover them a little bit. Um, and then you have things like benzodiazepines um, and other medications. People self-medicate a lot. I mentioned alcohol earlier. Um, not really the best treatment for insomnia um, because it does disrupt the quality of the sleep and leads to more uh, common, frequent awakening. Um, but there are a lot of nursing interventions. When we get to that section, we'll kind of cover those. The next disorder we can talk about is restless leg syndrome. Um, and restless leg syndrome, or RLS, involves uncontrollable movement of legs while you're resting or right before you fall, uh, fall asleep. So people have a lot of difficulty to fall asleep because they're uncomfortable. And the sensation may include like a twitchy or itching, creeping, crawling sensation, tingling sensations in the legs. And the only thing that makes it feel better um, is moving the legs around. So you kind of can't sleep because you're so busy trying to get comfortable um, that you just can't relax enough to fall asleep. Sometimes it's associated with iron deficiency. It can be associated with antidepressant use. Um, it can be familial, and sometimes we just don't know what causes it. But it is more common in women than in men, and it's more common in your older adults. Um, there are some medications. Requip, you probably have seen um, ads for on TV, and there are other anticonvulsant medications that can be used. Um, but we can teach a lot of self-care strategies, and we'll talk about that in our nursing intervention section. So um, there are some disturbances of what's called circadian rhythm, which is the rhythm of when you should be asleep, when you should be awake. And mostly we're looking at people who um, can't respond to the cues of ordinary, you know, it gets dark, it's nighttime, it's time to go to sleep. And we're talking mostly about people who work shifts, um, who work the night shift or work the evening shift, or have to get up very, you know, in the middle of the night to go to work. Um, their sleep-wake cycle is sort of interrupted, particularly if they don't work every day. So your night shift nurses who work 312s um, are particularly prone to this, um, as are people who travel frequently to different time zones. Um, their bodies just can never seem to figure out when they're supposed to be awake and when they're supposed to be asleep. Um, sometimes melatonin can be helpful for that, and there are some medications that can be helpful, like Provigil. Um, and sometimes you just have to give yourself time to adjust. Um, but that is something that um, is very common in nurses now that we're doing 12-hour shifts. Instead of working every night from 11 to 7, you're working some nights from 7P to 7A, and some days you're trying to push yourself through the daytime hours. Um, it can create a lot of um, difficulty. Um, and you'll have people who are just tired all the time, no matter what. Whether they're, they just their bodies feel like they should always be asleep, but they never can. Um, they may have uh, difficulty performing psychomotor tasks such as driving and they may be a little less safe on the job to be perfectly honest um, you know jet lag people who travel a lot might need an extra day every time they um, come back to a time zone so you end up with a lot of um, wasting a lot of time trying to figure out when you're supposed to be asleep and when you're supposed to be awake 
as I said, melatonin can be helpful for that. But it's something to be aware of, especially those of you who are going to graduate and do a couple years on nights. Um, it's, you know, you're going to have to learn to compensate for that. So next let's go to the um, hypersomnias, and these are disorders characterized by excessive sleep. Um, I'm going to use narcolepsy as our first example, and narcolepsy is characterized by a sudden involuntary um, urge to fall asleep. So this person could be mid-sentence, they're talking to you, or they're driving a car, and all of a sudden they fall asleep. Now they've gotten adequate rest at night, or whenever their normal sleep time is, but for whatever reason their brain does not regulate the sleep-wake cycle very well. And so they are overcome with sudden, um, like sort of loss of muscle control and, you know, this sudden involuntary sleeping episode. They do awaken easily, um, but, uh, you know, it can be a very dangerous disorder in the sense that this person could be driving a car or walking down the street and suddenly, you know, have no control over the urge to sleep. So um, this isn't the same as what's called pseudo-narcolepsy. Let me put that term up here. And pseudo-narcolepsy could be the person who's falling asleep while they're talking to you, um, but it's a result of sleep deprivation. So maybe we used to have a girl who worked nights in the, um, this is kind of scary, she worked nights in the nursery. And um, every so often she'd be talking to you and just fall asleep. Sometimes, you know, we had to be careful and make sure that she wasn't holding a baby when she did that. She wasn't really narcoleptic um, in the sense it's not like she slept all day and did well. She was kind of pushing herself to stay awake with her kids all day and then come to work and be awake all night. Um, and so she would have that sudden urge to sleep. But that was a result of sleep deprivation. True narcolepsy um, occurs in the absence of that sleep deprivation. Sorry, let me get that back up there. Okay. Um, and so that's really what narcolepsy looks like. Now, medically, the way we treat narcolepsy is with stimulant medications, very similar to the way we treat ADHD. So medications like um, methylphenidate or amphetamine, um, otherwise known as Ritalin or um, Adderall, you might even give a medication called Provigil, which is also a stimulant. So you would give this person stimulant medication, and hopefully that would help them um, retain vigilance and a wakefulness. Um, you know, because it would stimulate blood flow to those parts of the brain. Then sleep apneas really aren't um, a result of excessive sleepiness so much, um, but they can cause excessive sleepiness. Most of your sleep apneas are going to come in the category of uh, obstetric, um, sorry, obstetric, obstructive sleep apnea. Hold on, get that up there. So OSA or obstructive apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is characterized by some kind of airway occlusion, the most common of which would be like the tongue, um, sort of going in the back of the throat. Um, but sometimes it can be because the thyroid gland is swollen, um, or there's some other structural thing, there are deviated septum, or there's tonsils that are enlarged. Mom? Yeah, honey. No, sorry about that interruption. Anyway, um, and so... Some of the things that we do for obstructive sleep apnea, to diagnose it, first of all, there is a characteristic snoring pattern that suggests that there is a problem with um, obstructive sleep apnea. So the person will snore. The partner's not getting any sleep either. And there's a characteristic pattern. They snore um, regularly, and then all of a sudden, they sort of stop breathing altogether, and then you hear this kind of like, like gasping, grunting noise, and then they go back to snoring. Maybe they turn over in the meantime. Um, and the person will complain of excessive sleepiness. They might have been in bed for 12 hours and they are still just tired. They have gotten no sleep because they really weren't getting any oxygen to the brain. So now they're very, very fatigued. Um, obstructive sleep apnea can be a very serious problem. Number one, it leads to driving accidents. And number two, it's also associated with things like diabetes, overweight, stroke. Um, serious consequences can come from OSA. Um, so some things that we do for people with obstructive sleep apnea... Um, they are diagnosed, as I said, with a sleep study, and sleep study involves putting electrodes on the person's scalp, setting them up in a bed, and then you monitor. They, they put a, like a CO2 detector so that you can see what the person's, or a capnograph, so you can see how the person's breathing during sleep, and they have cameras so you can watch how they sleep, um, and they'll kind of look at all the different sleep-wake cycles. 
and when things occur. And they can tell you um, the degree of sleep apnea you have. Some people will end up getting CPAP. CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure, so I'll put that up here. And that, that's um, kind of a weird looking apparatus. I'll find a picture of it for you. Let me just. Um, but it's an oxygen delivery device. Hold on one second, I'll get a picture. And there it is, that's CPAP. It might not be the sexiest device, but believe me, if your partner snores all night, um, you will love them a little bit more for wearing this apparatus. Um, anyway, the other type of sleep apnea is central sleep apnea. It affects less than 1% of the people who suffer from sleep apnea, and it occurs in the brain. Um, so those are some things that you might want to know about obstructive sleep apnea. Um, once you treat it, usually the person all of a sudden can function on seven or eight hours of sleep very well um, because they're finally getting oxygen to their brain um, and the quality of their sleep is much better. So next let's talk about sleep deprivation, which is not in itself a sleep disorder. <clears throat> it may result from a sleep disorder, but it really is just a state um, that results from the deprivation of REM or non-REM sleep or both. Um, it can be caused by a sleep disorder such as insomnia or sleep apnea. Uh, but it can also be a circumstantial thing. For example, you're a patient in the hospital, um, or maybe you're giving care to somebody who's got Alzheimer's and they're up all night, um, or you've got a new baby and you're up with a nursing baby, um, students who um, are working and have to get their work done during times when they would normally be asleep. Um, those are some circumstances that can cause sleep deprivation. Um, just even having a chronic illness or something with symptoms that are bothersome during your sleeping hours um, can cause sleep deprivation. So some things that are uh, characteristic of sleep disorders, people obviously they get drowsy, they haven't slept so they get tired. Um, there's a general feeling of unwellness that might cause some nausea, stomach upset, um, dizziness, just a general feeling of not feeling okay. Um, people have a lot of cognitive symptoms with sleep deprivation, and I kind of want you to understand this. We have um, difficulty processing new information, so learning is impaired, completing tasks is impaired, attention is impaired, um, impaired decision making. And I want you to start thinking about this in terms of people who work um, as nurses and are uh, sleep deprived. Irritability, people get very irritable and they um, are unable to tolerate frustration well. Perceptual disturbances, you might have ringing in your ears or you might see um, like floaters in your visual field. Um, so those are some things that might happen. We also have some physical effects. You have weakened immune functioning. Um, and you can have some other symptoms as well. You might have like palpitations or whatever, especially if you're using caffeine to stay awake. Extreme sleep deprivation, if it continues for prolonged periods of time, such as when, you, um, when people who are prisoners of war are tortured, can lead to psychotic symptoms. Um, people will have delusions and hallucinations. They might get paranoid. Um, so those are all some things that might happen with sleep deprivation. Um, and what I want to call your attention to is that this can result in a big safety issue, both for the person who is sleep deprived and for others around them who rely on them to have good judgment. Um, people who get in a car and haven't slept in two days are dangerous. Um, nurses who work night shift and try to stay up all day with their families or to stay up to go to school um, very often are sleep deprived and they have impaired decision making and we know now that nursing is really all about making good clinical decisions from the data that we have if we can't process that data and we can't make good decisions um, and we can't complete tasks our patient care is going to suffer um, and there are a lot of studies out there that correlate um, sleep deprivation uh, in context of nursing and medical errors um, so that's something to be aware of. If you do end up um, graduating from here and taking a job on night shift, that's great. But do try to protect your daytime sleep and please try to make people understand. Sometimes people who don't work nights don't understand um, how dangerous it can be to keep somebody awake for that long. Um, it, makes, it makes the person sick and it can also endanger others around them. So that's um, a few facts about sleep deprivation. So when it comes to assessment um, of a person's rest and sleep needs, we usually just get a brief history, and that's kind of important when you're admitting somebody um, to a hospital or if they're coming to residential care. You want to find out what their sleep patterns are like um, and if they have any disturbances. So you're going to ask them what their normal sleeping pattern is. What time do they go to bed? How long does sleep last? Um, are they having any issues? Uh, what kind of sleep environment works for them? 
Do they have any bedtime routines, rituals? Um, have they had any problems with sleep? And do they use anything to help them fall asleep? And most of the time, if a patient's having a problem with sleep, they'll tell you. Um, so you might just ask them, are you having any trouble sleeping? Um, and what does your normal sleep pattern look like? And then you can kind of branch off from there. If the patient's not complaining of any um, sleep disturbance, you really don't need to investigate further. Just support what's normal for them. If they need a cool, um, you know, cool environment or if they need um, clean sheets, whatever the case might be. If they need PM care, if they need, um, you know, maybe soft lighting and low noise level, you just promote that. But if that person is already having a sleep issue, if they're waking up more than three times a night, if it's taking them a long time to fall asleep, if they can't stay asleep, um, can't get back to sleep once they wake up, or if they're reporting that all day long they're um, sleepy and that they can take a nap wherever they are, you might need to assess what's going on in a little bit more depth. And one tool that you can use to do that is a sleep um, diary. I mean, certainly there are more questions you can ask, but if you have a person who's complaining of insomnia, let's say you're in ambulatory care, you're in a doctor's office, um, you might ask them to give you a sleep diary that would sort of chronicle exactly which occasions um, the sleep disturbance takes place, maybe what some of the precipitating factors are. If they keep the diary for 14 days um, and they're pretty diligent in maintaining it, you can get a lot of good information from them. Um, now, you know, to get more in detailed information, you can always have a sleep study. Um, and that, you know, usually you have to go to a sleep lab for. They kind of put this paste in your hair and apply electrodes to the scalp, and that helps them look at brain waves. They put a um, device so that they can measure your breathing patterns, um, and usually hooked up to an EKG monitor. And they, you know, the usually the environment is pretty comfortable. Um, the bed is nice. Uh, there's TV. You know, the you know all the things that you might need to get a normal night's sleep. It's certainly not going to be the same as what you get in your house. However, um, they do try to promote normal sleep to see what happens while you're sleeping. Are you waking frequently? Are you having sleep apnea? Are you having disturbances of uh, REM and non-REM sleep? So um, a sleep study can be done and it's one of the ways that they diagnose um, some of the more common problems. Um, there are three basic nursing diagnoses that apply to uh, sleep problems. We have insomnia and we can use this one when a person has trouble falling asleep or staying asleep to the extent that it impairs functioning. Um, we can use sleep deprivation. That usually um, is when the symptoms of a disturbed uh, sleep or sleep disturbance um, become so problematic that the person can't function and so our care is going to um, target the symptoms of sleep deprivation that we already talked about. Um, so your dizziness, your drowsiness, confusion, <clears throat> impaired coordination. Um, those would be the things that we would target for that. Uh, disturbed sleep pattern is the diagnosis that we use when we have a temporary sleeping pattern um, disturbance. For example, the patient um, has a sleep disturbance related to hospitalization. Insomnia would be more of a long-lasting thing. Um, disturbed sleep pattern is more of a transient thing and sleep deprivation, again, we're targeting the symptoms. So when you're planning care for a person who has some kind of sleep uh, related disturbance. Um, you're going to make a goal that's appropriate and realistic for whatever their problem is and you're going to target that related to factor um, for intervention. So let's you know kind of play with an example here. Um, let's say that we have sleep pattern disturbance related to hospital admission as evidenced by um, patient states, I was woken up all night by different people, and maybe noise at the nurse's station. So that's maybe where we started, sleep pattern disturbance. <clears throat> so our goal might be, um, let's try and make a realistic goal. Um, patient state will state or will verbalize um, feeling refreshed. Patient will sleep six hours without waking. 
um, patient will fall asleep within 30 minutes. We'll make some realistic goals for that person. Um, and then whatever that related to factor is, we're going to be where our interventions are going to target. So if the patient's stating that he was woken up all night by different people and noise at the nurse's station, um, when we talk about interventions, we'll see that we're going to cluster our care um, to protect that person's rest, and we're going to keep the noise down at the nurse's station. That's probably one of the things that we forget a lot as nurses. If we're up all night, we forget that the patients are all trying to sleep, and we have to stay awake. And so, you know, for us, it's normal work hours. We might not think we're being loud, but the patients will complain that, you know, they heard everything we were saying. They'll tell us the conversations we had and what we were laughing about. And so these are things that, as nurses, you want to be very conscious of because it can be very, very disruptive to that person's um, overall health and well-being. Okay, so when we're planning our interventions, again, remember that person. We're targeting the related to cause, and he said that, you know, he was interrupted all night. We're going to try and cluster our nursing interventions. And when you look at your orders, a lot of times you'll see things like, well, vitals, cue shift. So you do them at 11. And then um, maybe at 12, you have an antibiotic that you can hang. And then um, you have a 2 a.m. blood sugar. And then at 4 a.m., it's time for vitals again. And at 6 a.m., you're doing I's and O's. And the tech's coming in and the lab uh, people are coming in to draw blood. Well, that leads to very, very disjointed sleep patterns. So maybe what you want to do is nudge a lot of your nursing care towards that 11, 30, 12 o'clock, and then maybe come back in. I mean, obviously, if you have something that needs to get done um, during those night hours, you do it and you try to be as um, provide as little disruption as possible. But if you can get a lot of them done at 11, 30, um, instead of waking somebody up at 11 and then at 12 and then at 1, um, it's a lot better for that person. Most times you have about an hour window either way to do vital signs or medication. You can rely on your agency policy for that and you're not really violating anything. If say the patient was supposed to get vitals at 12 and at 4, if you do them at 11 and then you do them at 5, you're still within your time window and you let that person have 5 hours of sleep or 6 hours of sleep. Um, and that's kind of a kindness that you can do for your patients. Try and avoid like letting your IV bag run dry so that the pump starts beeping. That wakes people up too. Um, stuff like that. Like anticipate the things that might interrupt that patient's sleep and, you know, try to avoid them. So if your patient's not critically ill, you really don't have to wake them at 4 a.m. for vital signs. You could get them up around 5, 5.30, do your blood draws at the same time. Um, if you have to do some kind of other kind of care in the morning, do it then. Um, and that's going to help. Now the big thing that I want to warn you about is the noise level. Um, this has come up in a lot of um, patient surveys where I work and certainly here at St. Francis and at other hospitals around the country, but um, the noise at the nurse's station has been noted as a problem. Most patients complain this is a big dissatisfier, so um, keep the noise level to a minimum. This means that, you know, I know, I worked nights for a lot of years, and you get close to your friends, and you kind of forget that it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're talking, and you're laughing, and telling jokes, or, you know, whatever you're doing while you're working. That noise gets to the patient's room, and you don't realize how distracting or disruptive it is um, because you're not experiencing it. They're already in an unfamiliar environment, and so they kind of pay attention. And we've had comments, people will recall details of conversations that you had with somebody and you swore you were being quiet and had a normal voice. Um, and this is a big dissatisfier. So, um, you know, most hospitals now have a quiet hospital policy. They don't page people overhead. They try to, um, you can't lower, you can't silence all your alarms. You need them. But try to anticipate um, things like your IV. When you're, You know when your IV bag is going to, empty and you're going to have to be back in there um, to replace it and that way you're not going to end up with a lot of beeping and a lot of disturbance um, and so that's you know kind of a an important thing you can't obviously control all the noise in the hospital because you have other patients um, who might be experiencing pain or um, whatever but you can try to keep as much of the noise level um, to a minimum as possible so the next thing that you're going to do is try and to create a restful environment. Now your book has a lot of suggestions on page 893 and we're going to discuss them um, because I'm not sure I agree with the author's rationale for some of them and I want to clarify um, 
for example, they say that you should keep the bed linens tight on the bottom and loose on the top. And I have already told you with activity and mobility, we really don't want to tuck linens tightly around people's feet. It can cause foot drop. Um, and people will tell you generally if they want their feet covered or not covered, but I would caution you against um, really tucking their feet in tight um, and putting them in an unnatural um, position. So um, loose linens in general, yes, but you, they should be clean and free of wrinkles and, you know, dry, obviously. Um, people feel uncomfortable when they're sweaty and, you know, I mean, obviously, just think of what makes you feel more relaxed and more like sleeping. Um, good body alignment, absolutely, that does facilitate relaxation and it keeps strain off the muscles so that when they do wake up, they feel um, not only refreshed, but they're free of that stiffness and soreness. Um, keeping the room dark and quiet. Quiet, yes. Dark is a little debatable. Um, you really need to almost have a night light on in every patient's room because of the risk of falling. Um, they're in an unfamiliar environment. They're not used to getting up and out of the bathroom. When you have patients who have some sensory deficits, they have visual problems. Um, having a pitch dark room um, when they have to get up and go to the bathroom can be uh, hazardous. So, you know, let's refine our definition of dark to include a nightlight <clears throat> just for safety. Plus, it helps you go in there when you're doing your hourly rounding. Now, you don't have to flash a flashlight in the room to wake them up. Um, and you should be doing hourly rounding. You should be checking on your patients every hour and making sure that they're okay um, and not agitated and not having difficulty. But you want to be as unobtrusive as possible. You want to be able to sort of go in, eyeball them, see that they're breathing okay, and then be able to walk out without ever waking them up. Um, so with the dark and quiet, kind of use discretion with that. Um, your book does also mention controlling the temperature of the room and providing good ventilation. That is important. Um, a cooler room is better than a warmer room, but if they're cold and they're shivering, you know, give them extra blankets, it's fine. Um, so that's kind of important. Now we're gonna get to another um, important idea and that's promoting comfort. Now when you learned how to do AM care, I'm sure to go through ATI and see what they're telling you, but um, they may have talked to you about giving back care or giving back massage with PM care, um, which is usually done around 9, 10 o'clock at night in anticipation of bedtime. We also do some comfort measures. So we're going to talk about promoting comfort. Um, back care is very um, relaxing to patients, so if you can get in there and kind of rub some lotion on their back, go over the scapula, do what's called effleurage, and we can talk about that in class if you're not familiar with the term. It's basically smooth, um, gentle massage that goes kind of up along the sides of the spine without touching the spine, and then down in circles. If I can find a little video to show you effleurage, I will, um, but that does promote comfort and relaxation and can help people get to sleep. We want to control things like pain, itching, nausea, um, because those things will keep people awake. So make sure that you know when your pain medications are due for your patients. Um, when I get report, one of the first things I ask is when was she medicated for pain last or when, you know, when is she due for pain medicine? Um, and I try to keep up with it. I try not to let that person go too long. Um, if they're itchy, you might want to give them either administer a medication for the itching, like Benadryl, um, or you know you might want to do some skin care, do, do a little lotion or something like that. Um, obviously, you want to treat nausea, and we talked about that in nutrition, so you can go back to that if you want to. Um, and then other comfort measure, measures, we talked about the massage, making sure that they have an appropriate snack. Um, oral care, mouth care is important. You know, you sleep better after you brush your teeth. Um, and really, just anything you can do to keep that patient comfortable. When we talk about supporting bedtime rituals and routines, if this is a patient who um, is a long-term care patient, you're gonna try and preserve as much of that routine as possible. It might be a little more difficult in an acute care setting, especially in the intensive care unit. Um, but people usually do have something they do before they go to bed, whether it's have a snack or read a book or watch TV. You can help them prepare for sleep. Children really do need those bedtime rituals. So if it's a story or if it's a teddy bear, if you tuck them in or say prayers, um, keeping those little routines intact is pretty important. Um, you know, you can put that in your formal plan of care if you want to. Um, and then with the bedtime rituals and routines, remind your patient not to engage in caffeine or nicotine right before bed. Um, 
if that routine included like say a glass of wine you're going to try and educate that patient a little bit more um, and that kind of goes with the next item um, which um, we're going to talk about offer appropriate bedtime snacks now um, for some clients particularly children and people who have difficulty being awakened at night I'm um, sorry I'm just going to try and make that yeah I can fit it in there um, people who frequently get up to urinate at night you might want to withhold too many beverages right before bedtime obviously you can use your common sense with that um, your book mentions complex carbohydrates that really kind of depends on your patient's condition obviously if they're MPO or if they're diabetic you're going to watch um, what you're giving them um, sometimes mixing a little bit of carbohydrate with some protein um, tends to keep their blood sugar stable so they don't um, drop out and you know if I don't know how many of you have any experience with diabetes or hypoglycemia but hypoglycemia um, that happens in the middle of the night it's fairly common um, to get a drop before um, dawn in your blood sugar and that can sometimes lead to nightmares and other sleep disturbances so you kind of you're gonna kind of try um, to promote um, healthy nutrition at bedtime um, you don't want to offer anything with caffeine. You don't want to offer anything with alcohol. This is common sense. Um, and so that would be important. Um, if people like warm milk, nothing wrong with that. I don't think there's anything magical about it. But remember, your caffeine-containing foods also include energy drinks um, and chocolate and colas. So watch those kind of foods when you offer them to people. Um, Promoting relaxation is the next thing. Now this is sort of, this gets a little more advanced. And this is sort of where we talk about um, relaxation techniques like progressive relaxation or guided imagery. Certainly if you have training in those things. And we will talk about these. Um, I do a lot with this in the labor support lab when you get to maternity. but um, And we can touch on it with pain. Um, and we'll touch on it again with, uh, in class with this. Um, but guided imagery is basically kind of having the person close their eyes and you walk them in their mind's eye through a scenario like, you know, pretend you're on the beach or you're walking through the woods. And that use of imagination um, does help that person relax. Progressive muscle relaxation is a technique where you tense one muscle group, take a deep breath, and then let all the tension go. Um, music therapy, some people like to, to listen to music, but it kind of depends. And people's taste in music is very individual. And so... It might or might not be something um, that you use to help that person. It kind of depends. And if you have a good relationship, let's say that you work um, in long-term care or rehab and you know your patients relatively well, um, it might be something you offer once you know them a little bit better. Um, just a little bit about maintaining patient safety. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit um, further than your book does. Um, your book talks about maintaining patient safety um, by protecting the sleepwalker and by securing all your tubes, your NG tubes, and your urinary catheters, and that's great. Um, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about um, things like that nightlight. Really important for you to have some kind of visibility for that patient if they do get up and walk. Um, you want to have the side rails, maybe two side rails up, but do not put that uh, put four side rails up. It's considered a restraint, and people have gotten trapped in the beds, so you want to be careful with that. A lot of elderly patients um, that have Alzheimer's actually get very agitated and disturbed at night. Um, and so you might want to make sure that they're getting daytime sleep. Another thing that you want to consider is that when patients are given um, sleep medications, your sedative hypnotics or your benzodiazepines, they're at higher risk for falls and if you're giving them narcotic pain medication as well. Um, so you want to put that person on a falls risk precaution. We're going to talk about that more with safety. Um, but that night light's important, the two side rails are important, giving them non-skid footwear, keeping your room free of clutters and spills, because people um, who are sleep disturbed or people whose sleep pattern is altered um, may very definitely become at risk for injury. So let's talk about a few of the things that um, promote healthy rest. One of the things that can help people um, have better quality of sleep is to make sure that they're following the same bed right, uh, bedtime routine every night. Um, when that happens, generally the body gets the message, the mind and the body get the message that it's time to get some rest. Um, so a regular routine is important. Um, maybe you want to shut down your computer or stop watching TV a half hour before. Um, maybe you want to read a book. 
um, whatever it is, brushing your teeth and, you know, all of that stuff. Follow that regular routine. That does help. Now, your book says to go to the bed at the same time. Go to bed at the same time every night. Um, and this is realistic for a lot of people who work a 9-to-5 job. Those of you who do the 312s on night shift, um, you might not want to be up all night every night. You might want to have some time with your family during the day um, every once in a while. So um, the way that a lot of us worked it out on my unit um, was that we would do our 312s in a row. We would do Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then kind of flip-flop the weekends if we had to. And that way we were doing half of our week on a consistent night schedule and half of our week on a consistent day schedule. It still wasn't easy, um, but it allowed us to have some kind of a life So um, and to, to regulate sleep. So trying to get to bed at the same time every night can also be a way to promote healthy rest. Um, use relaxation methods to promote sleep. Sorry, let me get that out of the way. And by this we're talking about things like um, the progressive relaxation and the visual imagery. Um, maybe people use aromatherapy, they might use massage, anything that helps you release the stress from your day, relax, and, um, you know, kind of lower that stress level in your body is going to help you sleep better. Avoiding arguments or emotional discussions before bed, well, half of that is going to be up to your patient, the other half is going to be up to the person that they live with, um, or, you know, their family members. So, um, definitely promote that. Certainly don't try and pick fights right before bedtime, but, um, you know, it, it kind of takes two to tango. So um, if you're advising a client, try to advise their significant others as well that bedtime is not the time to hash out anything um, like bills or um, problems the kids are having. You might want to do that earlier in the day. If you can't fall asleep in 30 minutes and you have insomnia, get up and do something else. Don't lay in the bed looking at the clock. That's only going to make you mad that you're not sleeping. So get up, do something, and then try again when you feel a little bit more sleepy. Um, and that is really good advice. Avoid caffeine, alcohol, heavy meals, and nicotine right before bed. And that's like one of those duh um, factors. that. But people sometimes don't realize. Maybe they have to keep that sleep diary that says, Oh yeah, you know, I had green tea, but I had it with dinner. I had black coffee with dessert, but that was 9 o'clock and I wanted to go to bed at 11. Um, so maybe they have to um, decide that they want to stop drinking coffee at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Definitely the alcohol not conducive to rest. Using earplugs to cancel noise, and this is something we can even do for our patients in the hospital. Um, and that will help. Sometimes those people who work night shift, who have to be up during the day, we give them um, sleep masks, which kind of cancel out the light. Um, so that can be good as well. Healthy exercise really does promote sleep. But you can't do it right before bed. If you do it right before bed, it kind of gives you that um, little rush of endorphins. And that can keep you awake. So exercise, but do it at least two hours before bed. Yoga could be an exception to that. You could really do yoga right before you go to bed. And a lot of times that is very, very relaxing. Um, use your bedroom only for sleep. Um, people forget and they use their bedroom as sort of a workstation. Sorry, I'm moving the background around. Um, they use their bedroom for home office. They use their bedroom for um, TV. You can use your bedroom for sleep and, you know, for intimacy. And that really should be all you use it for. Um, it shouldn't be the place where you socialize or talk on the phone because then your brain makes different associations. So that's that. Um, try to keep your bedroom as dark as safely possible. And I really want to stress that, you know, people, older people, fall in the dark. So... Darkness is good um, to the extent that it's safe. So um, you kind of have to negotiate that um, per the individual client. Avoiding naps. Now, your book talks about this. There's a few things in your book that I sort of say, eh, all right. There are some populations that really need a nap. If you're a new mom with a baby who's up three, four times a night, you need to nap to get your sleep and rest. But if, um, or if you're an older adult, and older adults a lot of times do need that power nap, um, it refreshes them and they sleep better at night. Children need naps up to about the age of five or six usually, although some give it up earlier. Um, the quality of their rest even at nighttime is better when they have naps. So they're not overtired. So avoid naps if they're disrupting your nighttime sleep. Um, and that would be the advice I would give. 
take a warm bath or shower before bed. That goes along with the concept of massage. Anything that relaxes your muscles is going to help you sleep better. Um, make sure you have a comfortable mattress and good body alignment. And those are some good ways to, um, in, to promote healthy sleep. So our last topic today, we're going to talk a little bit about the medical interventions for sleep disturbances, and most of them um, fall under the category of medications. First, we have our sedative hypnotics that are not benzodiazepines. An example of these would be Ambien, also known as Zolpidem. Um, <clears throat> Sonata is another one. There's a few of them. Um, and generally, they make people a little bit drowsy. They can give them fatigue. They can get like a little bit of a hangover effect. Um, there have been reports of people doing some of the parasomnia behavior, um, getting up, sleep eating, sleepwalking, getting in a car and driving and having no memory the next day. Most people do tolerate Ambien fairly well as a transient thing, um, meaning that they take it once in a while when they have problems getting to sleep. Um, so that's one class. Again, if you have people who are drowsy and um, fatigued, you want to watch them for any safety things, falling. Uh, you want to make sure that they don't excuse me, get in a car and drive. Um, next we have benzodiazepines, and you're going to see these medications in a few different places. We're going to talk about them a lot in psych when we talk about anxiety disorder. So benzodiazepines um, are another class of sedative hypnotics or anti-anxiety. Um, they have long-acting and short-acting. Um, some examples, we have alprazolam. A lot of them have that AM suffix. Um, and a lot of them have PAM, like the P-A-M suffix. Um, that's also known as Xanax. And you'll see a lot of um, people are on that. Um, oxazepam. Um, now we have good old lorazepam, which is also known as Ativan. You see that a lot with your elderly folks because it seems to work better for them with fewer side effects. Um, a lot of times what happens, people get very dependent on benzodiazepines, both for anxiety and for sleep, um, and then they try to get off them and they can't. Um, they can also cause a lot of slurred speech and fatigue and drowsiness, and again, all the same safety issues that you get with the other sedative hypnotics. They increase falls risk um, and can be very dangerous with alcohol, so you want to caution your patient um, not to use alcohol and to be careful using other prescription medications, particularly narcotic pain relievers and that kind of thing. Um, so those are your benzodiazepines. And then we have barbiturates, um, and those aren't as common anymore. Um, they still are used. Let me spell it correctly there. Um, they're, a lot of times they're prescribed less frequently because they lead to um, addiction and abuse. They are very powerful. A lot of times what the barbiturates are more helpful for, for excuse me, is um, seizure disorder um, because they do slow the brain waves um, and they can help control epilepsy and other seizure disorders. But you might see things like pentobarbital, secobarbital, amobarbital, anything that ends with that barbital suffix is a barbiturate and it's used, its original use was for sleep. Now you see them more for um, seizure disorders. Phenobarbital is the big one that you'll see more particularly with children. Tricyclic antidepressants. Um, I haven't seen those used as commonly anymore, but they could be. And these include like Elevil, um, which is also known as amitriptyline. Oh, geez, my spell correct there. Sometimes it's a lot easier for me to say the generic, but you should get used to, I mean the brand name, but you should get used to to the um, generic name because that's what NCLEX uses. So amitriptyline, imipramine, which is also known as tofranil. Um, there's a few of those drugs. Again, you hear more about them when we get to mental health disorders um, in Nursing 133, so we don't have to pound that to death. But they can cause, again, sleepiness and dizziness. Um, they do help, they tend to help more with people who have insomnia that occurs with depression. Remember we said depression was one of those things. Either the person sleeps all day um, because they have no energy at all, or they are, you know, they have really bad insomnia and they can't sleep um, because their depression keeps them awake. So those are the more common sleep medications that are used um, as, in terms of prescription. Um, you may have heard that we use diphenhydramine or Benadryl sometimes because drowsiness is a side effect. 
um, particularly with patients who are very vulnerable um, to the side effects of other medications. You can see them used. Um, Tylenol PM has that, so some of the over-counter medicines will have Benadryl as a component. And then there are a lot of things that you can also purchase over the counter that are um, herbal remedies, homeopathic remedies, and some of them are safer than others. You always have to be a careful consumer with that. Um, things like uh, valerian root or passion flower might or might not be safe. They don't tend to go under the rigorous testing process that other medications do. Um, but chamomile tea, lavender, um, things like that tend to be fairly well tolerated. Um, and as long as the patient understands, I mean, and there is some emerging evidence for some of these things. Like I said, chamomile tea, certainly really not going to hurt anybody unless they're allergic to it. But other things like the melatonin, valerian root, um, passion flower, kava kava is another one, I think. Um, you really want to make sure that that person is a careful consumer and that they're disclosing what they're taking to their physician because it might interact with other medications. And so that really concludes our discussion on rest and sleep. Um, bring your questions to class and we'll go over them and um, we'll move on.